good day, good evening, wherever you are right now on this planet. I welcome you on behalf of ComCall, ICOM International Committee for Collecting, and on behalf of We Are Museums, for our second meeting of the series Reflame Collecting. In this series, we investigate how we can rethink the practice of collecting as a strategy for collective care. Uh, in this year, the word care became central due to multiple crises we are going through. Crisis which did not surprise us at all, I would say, but um, instead strengthened our belief that our well being is strongly connected to uh, diversity of our communities, our society, and our planet. How can we care collectively and how can we provide care through our collections? And uh, at this uh, point, I would like to thank Daniela Quitten, the chair of ComCall, and Diana Derby, founder and curator of VIA Museums, both are here today, for organizing this series and making it possible for us to be here today and create this beautiful community. Uh, my name is Alina Gromova. I will chair today's meeting. I'm in my heart strongly affiliated with Call. I'm an affiliated board member of ComCall. I'm also a board member of uh, I'm Germany. I'm based in Berlin, in Germany, at the Jewish Museum there. And my work uh, mainly concentrates on visibility and empowerment of marginalized and migrant communities. Today, our meeting is on diversity as focus for collecting. We are going to raise the questions, what is diversity and why should we focus on diversity uh, in our collections? We're going to combine the general approach to diversity with collecting practices of concrete institutions. Uh, just to uh, give you notice that this meeting is recorded, so you can watch the recording afterwards, and uh, but the recording will remain in the community we are museums and con call so it will not go viral through the internet i'm happy to uh to welcome our two, two guests which we have today uh, julie Lockyer -Berg, based in denmark welcome julie and we have armando perla um based in canada and colombia colombia welcome armando Julie and Armando will give us short presentations, and the idea is that these presentations will act as inspiration for our discussion afterwards. We will start with Armando Perla. Armando is an independent consultant, activist, and curator. He currently acts as international advisory on museums, human rights, and social inclusion for the city of Medellin in Colombia. And he's a board member of the IC Ethics, ICOM International Committee of Ethics. He was part of the founding team in the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, where he held the post of curator. And he was also part of the founding team in the new Swedish Museum of Migration and Democracy. In his museum work, he has focused on prioritizing historically excluded voices. Armando, the screen is yours. Perfect, thank you. Um, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, being here. I guess good morning, good afternoon, whatever you are as well. Uh, let me try and share my screen here. Um, let's see if I can, yes. So um, yes, thank you again for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, be able to share with you some of um, different uh, practices. Um, I will start by presenting um, some of the examples from one specific museum in Medellin, which I find really, really great. But before that, I want to start by um, sort of talking about diversity and what diversity really means. But I want to like look at it from a more um, critical perspective. So I want to start by looking at um, what different um, authors and people have uh, talked about and have said about um, diversity. So um, I want to start with this um, quote, for example, from Angela Davis, um, which 
I'm sure everyone knows. Um, and she tells us that, you know, she has a hard time accepting diversity as a synonym for justice. And I think this is important. Diversity is a corporate strategy, uh, she tells us. It is a strategy designed to ensure that in the institution functions in the same way that it functioned before, except now you have some black faces and brown faces. It's a difference that doesn't make a difference. And I think this is really, really interesting, right? In the way that she thinks. And, you know, um, I, I sometimes like to think as well of diversity as a vaccine. No, 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 go ahead. Um, sometimes I like to think of uh, diversity as a vaccine that, you know, institutions or organizations use sort of to um, bring in some of those people, right? That um, they see as diverse and to keep doing things the way that uh, they've been doing it. So yeah, kind of like a vaccine. I like that analogy a lot. Um, and so here, uh, there is also uh, another uh, quote by uh, Sumaya Kasim, who, you know, wrote that amazing text that I think has influenced a lot of us who also work in this, uh, you know, feel of and trying to decolonize museum practice today, um, right? Um, the museum will not be decolonized, which is, you know, really seminal and really important. And she also tells us that, you know, when projects and institutions proclaim a commitment to diversity, inclusion, or decoloniality, we need to attend to these claims with a critical eye. Decoloniality is a complex set of ideas. It requires complex processes, space, money, and time. Otherwise, it runs the risk to become another buzzword like diversity. So again, right, uh, if there is no action uh, behind diversity, then there really isn't going to make a difference. And I think this is um, key in, in, in when we're talking about diversity. I think diversity is uh, one step, is the first step, right, to uh, meaningful change. But if there is no inclusion uh, paired with diversity, then there's never going to be structural change. There's never going to be justice, which is what, you know, Angela Davis uh, was talking about. Um, <clears throat> Here, um, just in my last segment about diversity, I just wanted as well to um, to show some other, um, you know, uh, women who have uh, talked about diversity as well, and you know some of their thoughts. So, for example, we have the first one, you know, that says um, diversity invokes difference, but it does not necessarily evoke commitment to action or redistributed justice. This is important, right? Because a lot of the times uh, in the museum where we work, there are um, embedded with all of these historical inequalities and, and if we, and an unequal distribution of power. So I think for us to be able to um, really have an impact, we need to start uh, redistributing this power and this justice, right? The, you know, this concept of justice really comes back a lot because uh, like Angela Davis says, we don't want to just stay stuck with diversity as a difference that doesn't make a difference. Um, and Yvonne here, uh, Ben Shop tells us that diversity does not appeal so powerful, so powerfully to our sense of social justice. Uh, again, that concept of justice. And then Sarah Ahmed, uh, tells us that diversity is a sign of the lack of commitment to change. It might allow organizations to conceal the operation of systemic inequalities. And then, I mean, here she's talking when uh, institutions, organizations keep using the language of diversity, right? Because it is a way for them, like I said, to vaccinate themselves, a, a way for institutions to show that they are actually doing something without actually doing something. And, you know, they start putting all these photos of, you know, people of different uh, ethnicities and this and that, and that is sort of as far as they go when it comes to diversity. And so, uh, Himani Banerjee uh, tells us that diversity is a coping mechanism for dealing with conflicting heterogeneity. But this is also very interesting, right? Because uh, why, you know, conflicting heterogeneity? This is, you know, like sort of uh, related to this whole thing about um, the next uh, quote, which is, you know, it's a, diversity is a technique by which liberal multiculturalism manages differences by managing its most troublesome constituents, which is, you know, kind of what I said as well, right? Is, you know, the people making trouble, we start just, you know, saying, yeah, we're all for diversity. And this is in the hopes that this is going to appease, you know, these people who are more uh, challenging, right? Um, and so what are the alternatives then? And what is what that I'm proposing to do to not stay just with diversity as a difference that doesn't make a difference? Um, so, you know, 
I mean, at the end of the day, what I'm proposing is the meaningful participation of uh, historically marginalized communities and the sharing of that power, right? Like, you know, what I talked about, like that unequal distribution of power that we've had historically in our institutions uh, is what I am proposing to really challenge. And for that, um, you know, I really like to talk about this museology from below, from the subaltern, from, you know, those historically marginalized, and to look at those practices that are taking place in different places. So this is um, sort of like uh, my own definition of what I believe as well um, human rights museology is, which I see it as, like I said, a, a museology from below. So as you will see uh, and hear, like what I believe is that we need to prioritize the participation, but not just participation, but the meaningful, the meaningful participation of historically excluded voices in all of the museum processes that directly affect them. This is important, right? Because if something is going to affect someone, they should be able to have a say on that. If someone is going to uh, talk about their stories and put them on a display, people should be able to have a say on that. And so human rights museology goes beyond using, um, you know, codified articulations or positivistic articulations of human rights. Because again, human rights as well is a very Western, you know, concept. So I like to include in here uh, anti-oppression, anti-racism, decolonization, indigenization, as tenets of museum work as well. So under human rights museology, participation means, and you know, I keep talking about participation, but what do I mean uh, by participation in museums? So participation means ensuring that historically excluded voices are empowered to have genuine ownership and control over all phases of a project assessment, analysis, planning, design, setting of goals, objectives and strategies, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. So in every step of the way. Um, and I think it is important here because human rights, we need to understand that not just this content, um, or, you know, that we put on walls and, you know, here I'm talking human rights, but I mean, of course, we're relating to like diversity uh, as, you know, migration. This is not just content. We need to understand human rights as a method of work. And this is kind of what I'm trying to do in here. Um, so this promotes the development and cultivation of longstanding relations, while also ensuring sustainability of projects in human rights museology. Um, may challenge the status quo and force institutions to acknowledge, repair, and redress the damages of unjust and unequal distribution of power historically embedded in their structure, which is kind of what we were talking uh, in the past. So my example that I want to show uh, right now are some of the practices that take place at the Museum of Antioquia. Uh, the Museum of Antioquia is uh, located in Medellin, in Colombia. It is a museum that is uh, located in a very uh, challenging area of the city, is downtown Medellin. So there's a lot of social issues that take place around the museum. There is uh, drug trade, there is poverty, there is violence, there is you know sex work, like a lot of different things happening. So these are also not just issues, but these are also um, the neighbors and the communities around the museum because they're also communities, right? And so the Museum of Antioquia has tried to, and I, and I try to think and reframe here, you know, that we're collecting, right? Because um, I don't like to say that we're collecting diversity, but I want to talk more about the inclusion and the care that we talked about at the beginning, caring for, you know, uh, these different groups and this historically excluded voices from uh, museum work. So, um, wanted to talk about uh, Museum 360, which is a macro project that the museum has uh, really developed. And uh, it brings together a lot of different, um, you know, initiatives uh, together. Some that were previously existing and some that came together starting in 2016. And the purpose of Museum 360 is to work together collaboratively and in cooperation with all the communities, the neighbors that the museum has, right? And it's not to disrupt in their lives, but for the museum to integrate and it's not for the museum to come and save them, uh, from, you know, any like di social dynamics that are happening, but it's more to be part of this um, dynamics as well. So this uh, that we're looking here, it's the space that is called La Esquina, it's called the corner. So this uh, space was opened by the museum on the back. The back of the museum, uh, it's spaced by a street that's called Condinamarca, which is probably the most dangerous street in Medellin. And uh, 
a lot of one, some of the things that they did is that they opened, of course, the windows to the street and they created this space called, like I said, La Esquina, which is a performance space, but it's also a place where people can come together. The way that um, they created the space is that they um, made it mimic um, some of the bars, the local cantinas in the area, because there's lots of cantinas in, in downtown Medellin. And so here you can see in that photo on the top uh, left corner, uh, the people gathering around so people can come and you know, it's something interesting that they said um, in the museum and the workers is that they wanted uh, to have dance dancing conferences, right? They wanted to bring people in here to, who could challenge and who really like, you know, have this really rich, deep, meaningful conversations and, you know, and, and challenge ideas as well that we take for granted. Uh, and something that is very interesting is that in this museum as well, there is a large uh, number of LGBTQ workers. So pretty much every curator, except for one, are from the communities, uh, you know, belonging to the LGBTQ uh, collectives. And this also makes a difference because then there's not that difference between us and them. It's, this is more blur, right? And so the collecting doesn't become, we're going out and bringing, uh, but it's more, like I said, it's all those dynamics are taking place. So here, for example, you're looking at uh, La Esquina where, you know, uh, different collectives, different groups have been invited. We're here at the center, we have a, a night of performance of uh, lesbian flamenco. We have on the top right corner, um, the ballroom group, the Tupamaras from Colombia performing, you know, a ball. Uh, and there uh, on the top, uh, sorry, in the bottom uh, left corner, we have uh, Medellin Drag, which is a collective of drag queens uh, who got together because they didn't feel safe. Medellin is a very conservative Catholic, uh, macho culture, right? So being from this collectives is actually very dangerous. So these drag queens came together so they could actually, as a group, go on the streets and not feel so threatened, right? And here you see uh, there, you know, in, in, the, in the top uh, left corner, uh, you see um, Juli, who is one of the assistant curators in the museum, who is trans, uh, non-binary, and you can see also the open window. So people, when they're walking on the street, they can see inside, they can, they can see the performances. And here on the uh, bottom right corner, you see a performance that is called Bitch Your Mind. Um, and this was a BDSM collective that came into the museum as well. You know, again, from the LGBT communities, even a more marginalized subgroup, right? That we don't really engage with and we don't talk about because sometimes we're ashamed uh, or we feel that, you know, we don't know. Um, so the BDSM uh, collective was brought into La Esquina to sort of uh, challenge that idea of uh, amatonormativity, right? Like the idea of romantic love. And they challenge how, uh, and they express how all, also romantic love can be very violent. And so th this is uh, this is really fantastic, all, you know, the work that happens um, over there. Uh, and here, this is another space that was open um, in the back, like I said, of the museum. Um, it's called Cundinamarca windows. So all of these windows were the ones in the back uh, of the museum, there's floor to ceiling. And what the museum did is that they opened them. And what uh, happens is that when people walk by there too, like as people can see inside of the corner of La Esquina, you can see inside of the exhibition space. So here you can see as well people, you know, and also the museum uh, makes displays, they, um, you know, showcase co their collections. Um, and, and a lot, and you know, when the collections, when I talk about it, a lot of, a lot of it is histories, a lot of it is people, performance. So it's really, really amazing to have to see this. Like, I mean, here you can see it's raining, right? Like it's pouring rain and people are there with their umbrellas looking at what's happening. And sometimes what happens as well is that uh, the people who are doing the mediation or the interpretation of what's happening inside of the windows or inside of the museum is the street vendors, you know, or the people who are on the street because the museum has connected so well with these communities and they have integrated so well that people are just happy to be able to as well to interpret the content and the collections inside of the museum. Um, this is a collective that was formed from one of the residences as well, part of Museum 360. Um, and this is a group of uh, sex workers, older sex workers who were also, you know, part of the community of the museum. This was part of a residency called Cundinamarca Residences, which brings local, national and international artists who made a commitment to work with the communities around the museum. And so this was in the residency of Nadia Granados, who's a performance artist from Colombia. And she worked specifically with uh, sex workers. And what happens in here is really great because um, these older sex workers were looking for a way to retire. 
and uh, and they couldn't find one. And so when they started to create this performance together, you know, with uh, the artist and the curator, one of the curators in the museum, they loved it so much that they just decided that we're going to get organized. And they became this collective and they just started doing other things, you know, like embroidery, like performances. And now they're really well known across Colombia. Um, and so they have been able to as well retire from uh, sex work. And I'm not, you know, like in any way or shape uh, <laughs> saying that sex work is not, like I'm not, you know, putting any judgment on sex work what I'm saying but you know this is what um as well um they wanted to do and I think it is wonderful because they really love uh the performing and um here this is another space that was op open also in the back of uh the museum which is called La Consentida or the Pamper Girl and it's an exhibition space uh with the purpose to also engage with communities the communities around the museum right so for example what happens in here is that the museum brings some of the communities uh, to look at the collection and to look at the different pieces that they have. And so that's the starting point of an exhibition. And here what we're looking is uh, the exhibition from uh, La Procesión. So La Procesión was the piece, the work of art that was the beginning of this exhibition. It is, uh, you're, seeing it, you're seeing it here. Um, it is a woman who is going to see the clergy. And what's interesting about this as well, it says it's a painting by Deborah Arango, who was a very famous Colombian artist. She was born in Medellin in 1907. Um, she was the first woman to um, work on uh, female nudes uh, in the country. And she was seen as very transgressive because no one else was doing this, right? And she was also depicting women as, you know, sort of breaking with this um, canons of morality that, you know, society was imposing on them. Um, and in uh, here, like, you know, you're seeing, for example, this woman who was, you know, wearing like, you know, red nails, long red nails, which, you know, women were supposed to, this painting was uh, done in 1940. And so, and then you see as well, she's got the bare shoulders. She's not wearing a shawl like she was supposed to. So she's again, transgressing with that. And this exhibition was created with a collective of trans women from Casa Diversidad. Um, and the women chose this piece because, uh, and here as well, you see in the, in the um, bottom left corner, you see Juli, who is uh, the, you know, um, the trans, uh, person who was as well performing in, in, in a previous uh, image and she was also very involved in here and she was a connection with the community as well because she's also part of that community and the reason why the women chose this image or this work is because they saw the work of Deborah Arango as transgressive as their own bodies and you know when they talked about why it's because they said that they have been also transgressing all of those moral canons and all of those social and moral expectations that Medellin society has tried to impose on them and they have broken that with their own bodies. And so this was a, a really great exhibition as well that took place there. And just to end here now, um, you know, all of these initiatives from Museum 360 have also uh, permeated uh, the rest of uh, the museum collections and the rest of the museum work and the rest of the exhibit, the exhibit work that also happens in, in, in the museum. This, uh, what we're seeing here right now, it's uh, what they've called the decolonial gallery. So they have started to reframe all of the permanent galleries as well. And this is really great because the, the interpretive plan and the curatorial approach was divided in three moments or three different spaces. And one was, hell, purgatory, and paradise. And this is because they were challenging this, like I said, this is very conservative, very Catholic um, society in Medellin. And um, obviously all of the queers, uh, we go in hell. So here you're seeing an image of hell. And uh, you're seeing again as well, uh, Juli, who is here uh, in the bottom uh, left corner giving a tour of, uh, of the gallery in drag as well and on top uh they are giving as well a performance uh they are dressed as a priest because they're challenging again these ideas of real you know of um really religion uh in in colombia and here you can see some of the works that have been acquired for the collection that are breaking with uh those ideas of who gets to write the canon of history or the art history in Colombia and who belongs, who doesn't belong. Something that, for example, Juli has 
try to do a lot is to break this uh, masculine narrative. So for example, in the first images that we saw in the skin in the performance, we saw the lesbian tango, the lesbian flamenco, um, all these different things, because it was important for them to break away as well from that dominant voice of the male cisgender gay man who dominates also the voices of the LGBT community. And so this is uh, some of the work that I think uh, can really look at uh, going beyond diversity in our museums, in our collections, and in integrating all of these practices. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Armando. Uh, this, this was beautiful. And uh, this is also uh, links us to the first session uh, we had on queering collections. And uh, so we see that uh, intersectionality, intersexual approach uh, is something which we uh, which, uh, is with us and it's the only approach we can actually use. And, uh, and also thank you for introducing us your, your thinking and conceptualizing of diversity so we all know what we are talking about here. Um, I, uh, I see that there are many people whose cameras are not on. Uh, you definitely have reason for this and we are not pushing you because we are a small community and we would really love to discuss afterwards and to see our faces. So if it is possible, just let us see you. Thank you so much. And we are proceeding um, with Julie Rockyerberg. Julie is director of the Women's Museum in Aarhus in Denmark. Courses are among others cultural development, exhibitions, art history, communication, branding, digital solutions. She previously worked at several art museums, including Aros, Kagens Museum, and Skovgard Museum. She studied literature and art history at Aarhus University. Julie, the screen is yours. Thank you, Alina. And uh, hello everyone. I will just uh, start out by sharing my presentation. <clears throat> so you can see Alina? Yes. Yes, good. Okay, well, uh, yes, I am a director of the Women's Museum in Denmark. It is uh, a national museum uh, for the cultural history of gender. And uh, the museum is located in Aarhus, which is the next uh, biggest city in Denmark. It is located in Jutland. And this is our beautiful building. We are located in uh, the old city hall of Aarhus. It also used to be a police station. So it has really been quite the male dominated building, but now it's a women's museum. And the women's museum started in uh, 1984. And what is very special about uh, my museum is that it is, uh, it's really uh, a grass, it, it's born out of a grassroots movement. It's born out of the 70s women's movement in Denmark. It's made literally by a group of women who painted the building, who started building the collections all by themselves, uh, raising money uh, throughout the 80s. And, um, and finally, in 1991, they got, um, you know, a state recognition and the museum is now a, a state museum. So it's quite the history. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's some very great shoulders to, to stand on. And, and my vision for the museum is really to honor this beautiful beginning. Um, the museum um, wanted to um, collect and show the invisible history of women, all the things that have been eaten up or worn out, uh, all the work that women have done throughout the ages. Um, when they started collecting, uh, many of the, the givers of objects, they, they said, oh, you really want this? You really want my you know, birth control objects? Do you really want my old dresses and so on? But it's a very important point of this museum that it is um, kind of 
a safe place for unsafe objects. It's a safe place for unsafe stories. It's a safe place for stories about uh, violence, um, backstreet abortions, all the stories that you don't, uh, you, you didn't see it in the museums uh, in the 80s, I can tell you. So it was really a progressive museum um, from the beginning. <clears throat> Today, we, we still collect, uh, you know, uh, stuff that you wouldn't say is, you know, crown jewels. Uh, this is uh, one of my favorite examples for, for the way we collect. Uh, we collected this pen uh, to the right, uh, the, the big pen for her. We all know the blue one, but the, the big pen we collected, we bought it actually on eBay um, in 2017. And why did we do this? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a pen for her. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very special. Uh, it comes in purple and pink and it has glitter on it and it's very expensive. But the fun part of this pen is that on the back of the package, it says specially made to fit a woman's hand. So it tells a grand history of the meaning of gender in society that we are all surrounded by gender in one way or another and that the world in a uh, it, the world is really divided into he and her. And we want to uh, be norm critic about that. So that's why we collect stuff like this. Um, our exhibitions are always, we, we always try to make them very interactive because we, we want to collect people's uh, debate about gender in, directly in our um, exhibitions. And that means that people can really leave a mark in our exhibitions, they can write, they can talk, they can draw, they can they can speak. Um, yeah, um, that's very important for us, and we can really use this knowledge um, to the exhibitions coming after. So we are really like some kind of um, um, yeah, I don't know the word, but but we're really sucking knowledge out of our audience all the time. Um, yeah, and also by doing this, uh, people reflect in another way. When they are asked questions in the exhibitions, they, they really reflect. I mean, um, they, we, we, for example, we, we, ask, we ask them to draw their own gender in some part of our exhibition and people, they, they, really, they really draw. We, we have to you know, shift the papers all the time. They, they go crazy about this and it's just such a simple task but it really makes um, people's minds going. And as you see, our international audience, they, they actually often comment statements like this. It says, Denmark is awesome. This sort of this discussing exhibit would never, never <laughs> be shown in the USA. And, you know, comments like this is just, oh, that's what I love uh, in my work. That's what I'm going for. Um, we also actually collect artifacts directly in the exhibition. Um, this is our uh, Wunderkammer. This is our uh, place with gendered objects, uh, things that you have from you are a baby until you're old. And uh, as you see on the sign, it says, have you got something to put in the exhibit? And people, they, <coughs> they, they contact us and in the reception and maybe they have something in their bags that they suddenly think about, wow, this is such a gendered object. And then they deliver it to the museum and we collect it. And sometimes it actually goes into the permanent collection. And this also means that our, this is actually a permanent exhibition, but we don't use the term permanent because our uh, exhibitions, they change all the time. So it's not um, a concept that we use because we want to keep uh, moving with the debate. Of course, we have uh, the history um, as sort of some sorts of a, of a fundament, but um, but but we are in movement all the time. Um, I have three, you know, headlines that I wanted to emphasize today, and the first one is that um, at my museum we are constantly reminding ourselves that museums have the superpower of public trust. We know that we have a special place as an institution in society. People look up to us. They find us trustworthy. Uh, secondly, uh, we are very much aware that museums are not neutral. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a women's museum, right? 
uh, all museums, as you know, are men's museums. Uh, but our museum is, um, is you know, the, the non-critical museum that, that proves this point that museums are not neutral. Thirdly, uh, we say to ourselves that museums can and they should be agents of social change because this is why museum began in the first place, actually. So that's really something we try to um, yeah, uh, talk about all the time. And our vision is this, uh, we aim to be a leading platform for knowledge and dialogue about gender in order to inspire and in engage the audience to create an equal society. So basically, um, we want to change the world and it's always good to have big goals. Yeah, we are, as you might have guessed, we define ourselves as an activist museum and um, and we have uh, a strong community uh, built uh, in Aarhus. We have uh, near contact with uh, all sorts of activist groups. Uh, of course, Aarhus is a very, it's a large student city. We have a very famous university in Denmark. It's, uh, and the campus is located downtown. So it's a very young city. And that means that, that we can really mobilize very quickly whenever we need to do a demonstration and we actually do demonstrations uh, once in a while. This is our equality for all demonstration um, about 500 people attended. This is from 2017. You might guess what this demonstration was about. It's a women's march. Uh, it was done just after the US election. Um, and there are some pussy hats in the front. And the police in Aarhus estimated that around 2,000 people participated in this demonstration. And the way we, um, you know, participate as a museum, first of all, we actually are the initiator of um, the demonstration. We organize from beginning and mobilize. But we, we also organize, uh, you know, the banner workshop in advance that you can come and make your own demonstration banner. And we, of course, show historical demonstration banners. Uh, we have uh, talks uh, uh, before and after uh, the demonstration. So we try to put it all in also a historical context. And it's, it, it's very meaningful uh, to do, to, to do uh, museum work in this way. And it really makes uh, the history uh, come alive, I think. Also, um, we always try to push the boundaries of what I mean, how much, how much can we do uh, and still be a museum? And uh, one of our initiatives is this pop-up museum. And it looks, you know, quite simple. It is very simple. It's just this little Piaggio wagon that we have redecorated. And we have different exhibition concepts that we can fill in it. And then we drive to malls, uh, library, libraries, uh, the streets, um, you know, showing these small exhibition and talking um, to the public. And, and it's, it's very valuable for us because we can really uh, get a sense of where is the gender debate uh, where, you know, with uh, at the people who do not come into our doors because we know that there can be a big barrier, um, you know, in going to a museum especially when you're called a women's museum. Um, so this is a way to, um, to reach communities uh, and, and get dialogue, dialogue going um, with other people than our main audience. Yeah, and we really try to have a strong nerve in all that we're doing so that what we are saying and doing is you know, always very clear. So also in our marketing, we use these uh, statements. Um, and Diane, you know this one because this is from 2016 and I showed this in Riga. Uh, and we actually still use it. Um, you know, Museums are awesome because everyone shuts the fuck up. And I don't know why, but it, it went viral and it, it was seen around 2.5 uh, million times uh, on Imager. And um, it's of course ironic, but it also elaborates on the fact that that women uh, historically has not been allowed to, to speak as much as men has. Um, yeah, 
And also in our merchandise, you know, we have these badges. We really want to, you know, again, push forward to a more equal community in every little thing that we do. And you can say, oh, that's just a badge. But, but actually, this is our biggest sell, these badges. Uh, we, we sell a lot of them. And if people are wearing them, they are spreading the message. So small things can really make an impact, I think. Um, also, our research is activist driven. Right now, we have um, a three year uh, research project with Aarhus University, which explore the types of activism that takes place in everyday life and everyday spaces. And it investigates also uh, how research and uh, the museum work um, can aspire to social change. And it's very interesting. I'm finished just in a minute. Yeah, that was it, actually. That was the last slide. So that was it for me. But uh, I hope this has maybe inspired to the discussion hereafter. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was very inspiring. Uh, museum which openly says we're an activist museum and we are uh, we do an activist it's inspired research and uh, I got a lot of inspiration from different concepts you mentioned from uh, uh, giving say safe, safe space for unsafe objects for example or an exhibition which is not a permanent exhibition which I think for many museums is um, a huge thing to claim something like this and so thank you so much uh, I would love, before we all jump into discussion, give you, uh, Julie and Armando, opportunity to, to, to react to your uh, presentations, if you want, so if you have questions or comments, Julie. Yes, uh, Armando, I just wanted to say thank you so much. It was a pleasure hearing you and seeing uh, your examples. And I really, I would like to stress that I like the term, you know, the back of the museum. I mean, of course, it was very concrete uh, with your examples, but I mean, the it, it, it's, a, it's a whole theory, as I see it, the back of the museum, because it's actually the way that, that I work when I think about it. And I think I will take that with me, that the back of the museum can actually be, um, you know, a, a better opening uh, for a broader audience than the front of the museum. So I think we should all think about the back of the museum. So that was just what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Julie. And I, I also really appreciate uh, your presentation. I mean, um, I think it's wonderful work um, that you're doing. There were also, you know, a few things that you said that um, completely are in line as well, you know, with um, a lot of the work that um, Museum of Antioquia, but also some of the other museums in Medellin do. Um, and it is this idea of uh, telling those untold stories, right? Those stories that have been invisibilized. I mean, they're not invisible because they have been made invisible. And so I think that's really, really great. I really love that. I think that's something that um, it's common to a lot of uh, museums that are trying to work this way and to bring these voices to the forefront, right, from the back, like you said, but to the forefront, and I really enjoy that. There was also something else that um, really um, stuck with me, and it's that, you know, when you said, like, you know, that you have uh, people coming to the museum before marches and giving them a space, a safe space to create those banners. And this is something that I've heard not just in Medellin, but, you know, in many different places like here in Canada as well from community, especially, you know, trans community, women speaking about how museums should be these safe spaces, these community spaces. This, you know, they said it literally, just give us four walls. We need spaces where we can feel safe, where we can go and do our work and where we don't have to be on the street doing, you know, what we're doing. And, and I think museums um, need to see themselves as these community centers, which I think is as well what you know what you are doing in uh, the Women's Museum and also what people are doing in in uh, in many of the museums and cultural institutions in Medellin. So yeah, I also really enjoyed that. Thank you. Uh, just a comment to that: we actually have a, a free space uh, at the ground floor that we call the X space, and that is reserved to. Uh, 
any group who wants to uh, put up an exhibition or anything of course, it has to be related to, to gender in some way or another. And of course, we have some kind of filter. But when we have when we have let a group in or a person in, we actually just lose control and let them do everything. And we let them take over our communication channels. And it really, it's so rewarding. And, and uh, it's also difficult in some way, but, but it's really, we are so inspired each time. So yeah, it's a... Uh, that that's um that's really great example and that's you know that also relates i guess to uh the work that um i was doing in in sweden which you know was what uh that project sort of that experimental project of the museum of movement and it was um i guess it started like that as well which was you know like having of this space that was uh completely led and controlled by the different groups and collectives and communities whatever you want to call them to come in there and just take you know use the space i mean we had groups of uh community theaters you know coming in there and doing their practices because they didn't have a space where to do it outside and you know we have um groups of uh trans dancers that will come and do their practice uh the pan-african cafe which was a brunch that would take you know place once a month from the afro-swedish community like all these people leading all that programming and exactly i mean it was it was it was fantastic to um to work with that and like i said of course there's many challenges with that and it's not easy but it was very rewarding as well Okay, um, if, if you wish, we, we open it up, the uh, room to a group, so um, please feel welcome just to jump in and to give your comments, questions, whatever you feel like right now. Uh, I see Sandra. Hello everyone, uh, from Germany, I'm Sandra. I work for a documentation center and museum of migration and we are on our way to build a museum. So I'm pretty much exactly like you described, Julie, sucking up all those ideas. That's amazing. I really, I really hope we can do that kind of stuff in our own place. And it's, uh, yeah, the museum of the future is looking good. Um, Armanda was wondering about something. Um, when you said the museum of Antioquia is in a very conservative environment. I wonder how does the classical museum visitors, how do they react it, to that kind of thing? Is there conflict? Is there resistance? Um, I love conflict in museum. I think it's a very productive thing, but I'm wondering how do you, how does the museum deal with it? In a, how, how does that work? You know, yeah, there has been a lot of conflict in that way. There's a lot of reactions. I mean, Every time they do something that is like, you know, challenging the church, the Catholic church or whatever, there will be articles in the newspapers, there will be this, you know, critics, people like, you know, saying, oh, you know, why they even get money, they're like publicly funded, they're like this and that, but they have a very strong, not just a very strong director, but they have a very strong commitment to their communities. And so the way that they, um, I guess, go around that is that front and center what they're trying to do is to work with those communities and not only sort of to because people think it's they're just doing the work just to like be controversial or this and that but what they're very clear about is that together right like they have these common goals with the communities um to better uh and like i said it's not like a you know like a savior kind of thing <laughs> but to better the lives of the people that they're working with. And that includes as well, the reclaiming of the space. And like I said, because the museum is in a space that has been very violent that it has been seen as, you know, having all of these social issues and they're doing this amazing work with creating safe spaces. Um, so I think they can uh, do a lot more. And it's very interesting as well, because in Medellin, it's not just the Museum of Antioch. I chose this one example, right? But I'm working as well with Museum Casa de la Memoria, with you know some other like um, establishments, and they um, all of these museums um, are very committed to their communities and to the people that they have around. So I think they also have the support. No, I don't think like I know that they also have the support from uh, the museum community in Medellin, which is very 
strong and they're very close and they work together. And I think that is also, uh, Medellin is a very special city in that way. So I'm very lucky to, you know, well, I was going to say to be there, but I'm not really there physically right now, but like to be able to work there um, because um, people are very supportive of each other. And I think that also helps when those controversy comes, you know, you have a strong network in there that will help you as well navigate all those things. But it's not easy. I mean, it really isn't easy. Just a couple of years ago, um, the city decided to raise the um, LGBTQ flag and, you know, people from the city came, they turned it down, they burned it and they made like a huge thing. So it is that kind of society, right? And to be working in there and to do this kind of transgressive work, like that's why, you know, I'm always, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's very moving to be able to do work like that and to work with people in museums like that is just one of the most amazing like feelings that you can have. Daniel. A very comical question, uh, just dropping it in because Julie, you were showing us the picture where people could bring in their own objects and you were saying, uh, people would hand in objects and it might be that they would enter the collection. Can you tell a little bit more about how that process goes? So how do you decide what gets into the collection and what not? Um, I mean, our collecting strategy is an act active collecting strategy um, because uh, we, we know that we know what we need in our collection. We, we know what or we know what we don't need. But it, it's, uh, it takes place in different ways. Um, yeah, sometimes we have uh, audiences going to the reception with stuff. And the reception has this um, uh, handout where you can write your contact information and you, you sign. And then our registrator follows up and, and gets more information about uh, the object. I mean, it can be yeah, a, a pen or something. Um, uh, and, and that, that's one way of doing it. We all also have people writing us mails after visiting the exhibition because they, they come home and they think, oh, maybe this could be something. Um, and, and then we take the dialogue from there. But also we do another thing, which is, which is even more active, is that we do events, as a, collecting events, where we invite people to get a, a tour and it's free. And they get a tour or a talk uh, with me, uh, but it's only free if they bring uh, a, a gendered artifact. They have to reflect what do you have in your house that has a gender. So they have to bring something. And then we put the things on a table. I don't know if you have programs, TV bro programs in your countries like this, but it's like you know, you know these pro programs where you belt. Um, Put a value on um, antiques you know uh, we do it like that we have a table with a white cloth and we put it up and we me and our, my registrator we, we are like hmm could this be is this interesting is interesting what's the story who has uh, owned it and so on you know all, all the all the stuff that you consider when you are collecting and then then you then we together we say oh yeah this should this should be you know conserved for the future or we say no because this is not interesting enough and then on to the next so is that answer enough <laughs> absolutely a very interesting and it is actually very similar also to to different things that we are doing and I was just another thing that I, um, I was wondering what we are working about also is not only that that you you have like the donor museum relationship but how do you deal with things that participants bring in and how then do you discuss with them shared ownership about the objects and also can they have um, can they also say what they don't want a, their object to be used for for which story they they don't want it to be used etc and what kind of agreements do you do you already work on that we actually uh, in Denmark museums work in the same way when they collect and we have these different agreements you can also have a five year um what can i say mm, uh, yeah five year term and then you then you can redecide if you really want to donate the thing 
you can all also, of course, choose to be anonymous. Uh, you can also choose to, um, yeah, there, there, there are different ways of, you know, signing off. Um, yeah, but 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 the point is that we are very flexible, but but we really aim to to do it as uncomplicated for ourselves as possible, so that we don't have to administrate too much. So we really try to convince people: do you want to do you want to donate or not? Are there too many, you know, restrictions? It might be a better idea to just say, okay, maybe maybe you should just keep it. But but you have to think that most of these these things they, they are not valuable objects. It's often, for example, we had someone who brought a tea, a tea uh, a pack of tea because it's called woman's tea, and the story was that um, she was a secretary at a at an at an office with a lot of men, and this kind of tea was on sale, so she bought like ten packages. But no, nobody would drink it because it said woman's tea on it. <laughs> and that's a great story. So of course, uh, yeah, so, so no restrictions on that tea package, but it's a great object, you know? <laughs> um, I also have something um, about that, Danielle, and I think I'll take the case of the Canadian Museum for Human Rights as well, because it is a very different type of collection, right? Like it's um, a digital collection and in there we were collecting stories, we were collecting oral histories. So in the way that um, we sort of share that responsibility with uh, the different communities that came to the museum, it's that um, we also had them uh, collect with us and decide on what we were collecting. So for example, um, not just me, I, I was a curator over there, but ju not just as a curator, I wasn't the only one doing the collecting. I was actually, or doing the interviews, right? Because that was the way to collect the oral histories. So we would work with the community so they could identify the people who they wanted to be interviewed. We would develop the questionnaires together as well. Um, they will be the ones conducting the interviews. They would, you know, also um, search uh, the places where the interviews will take place, what, you know, because they knew where people will feel more comfortable as well. So all of the things and also for all of the ownership, that was, that's really key. That's so, you know, it sort of like came all back. Um, and it was because of the law in Canada, when you're collecting oral histories, when you're doing this type of um, interviews, the law immediately gives the property to the museum or to the person who's collecting it. And it was similar as well in Sweden. Um, so we needed to figure out a way in which the museum wasn't going to be the one keeping the ownership of those stories because we didn't think it was ethically responsible. Responsibly. And um, so what we came out with was this kind of um, idea of an osofructus where um, the museum will collect things, but because we also, you know, were working together with the community and the community was doing the collecting and those was easier, right? When the community was collecting, it was easier because the, you know, ownership would be transferred directly to them. But when it was the museum doing the interviews, what we would do is that we would um, revert the rights and give the ownership back to the community and then, or the person who was doing it, and then the museum would keep the use of that interview. So we will be the repository for them, for their, um, in this case, object, right? It wasn't a material object, but it was um, a digital, it was a story. So we will keep it and that way we were able to also get around because especially for uh, that museum, being a national museum, the collection belongs to the country, right? It belongs to the government that we didn't want those stories to belong to the government, we want them to belong to the people. So yeah, so there was, you know, all these things about ownership and whatnot, but yeah, it is interesting as well. Great, thank um, you. Can I jump in with a question um, regarding uh, this discussion? Uh, I mean, we, uh, when, when we talk about um, collecting things which are valuable to the communities and which communities themselves think they are important to them, um, 
because uh, we uh, we worked uh, in Berlin with uh, uh, Roma and Romnia community, and uh, so what we realized, and uh, we have an um, archive of uh, Romnia community, and this archive does not have uh, actually um, it just one room, and the collection, if you think about collection in classical way, is very small. So the, what uh, what women are doing, they're actually going to homes of Romnia uh, and Roma people and talk to them and drink tea. And because they say that um, uh, um, people uh, don't really have this notion of what does it mean to have history, right? So for me, uh, we have to go one step back because when we invite people and think that people know what is valuable, we assume that the, the empowerment process already happened, but um, you can can you talk about your experiences with such cases where you realize something like a um, yeah something like memory or cultural memory have to be built first? Maybe both of you. Um, yeah, and I think maybe I can talk um, as well a very um, specific case in here, which is I'm working right now as well with um, a community in uh, Mexico, in Huejotzingo. Um, and they are, um, they are the town or the city that has the largest carnival in Mexico. And uh, they have all these traditions and amazing culture, amazing traditions, right? That they're transferring orally from generation to generation but right now the elders are passing away and so a lot of this knowledge is being lost and it's really amazing that there has been this collective that has been formed of the youth in the town that are working in preserving all of this and like you said right a lot of the people have things or the people have all these objects or stories but they don't really understand sometimes the value of it and the youth they have taken the task to go door to door, you know, going from neighbor to neighbor and talking about the carnival and talking about the traditions and talking how important, you know, all of this is for them as a community. They have done, they created a museum uh, in one of their houses and they bring the school children into their home. They do the program and they explain, they've done all this archiving, you know, research, finding photographs that the town has never, people in the town have never seen. We found photos and archive even in Sweden, you know, from a national museum that had gone to Wehatsingo and I hold expedition, you know, like in two centuries ago. And so they've been bringing all of these objects so that to create that um, sense of um, a shared heritage, right, for the town. And in this way, people have come and been like, oh, you know what, like I have this mask that my grandfather used, or, you know, I have like this, or we should do this. And another thing too, that we've been working and talking a lot, it's about, um, and, and I mean, in this case in particular, because they don't really have a physical structure, like they don't exist as such as a museum, but in other cases as well, is it's about the obsession that sometimes as museums, we have to collect and to like extract things, but instead as well talking about, and something that we're trying to do there is to create capacity building. So the community um, can have the skills to actually be able to store, to create their own archives and to be able to store and have their own collections, to care for their collections so they don't have to go into an institution. So instead of being so extractivist, right? And I think there, there are other examples too out there, you know, the Smithsonian Museum of um, African-American History does a lot of programming on this way as well. Like they go out and they work with communities to create this capacity building. And I think this is a really good way as well of thinking of collecting, the collecting of the future, right? Like not just inside of the institutions, but inside of the community. So again, outside of the walls of the museum. Thank you. More questions? We have comments yeah. in, the, in the chat, actually. A lot of different kind of comments. Um, the last one is, is by Selma. Selma says, I love the idea of empowering community members to identity, conserve and share heritage. Yeah, so this notion of shared heritage and uh, empowering community, uh, which we talked uh, about it already, 
Thelma, do you, do you want to talk about it or your microphone is not working? Hello, everyone. I'm sorry, I just joined in now. So um, I was just echoing the previous speaker and just saying that I really appreciate the experience that they shared, but I just want to listen a little bit more before contributing. Yeah. Dear Jim, maybe I can, I, because I see you and I know you and I know the projects that you're working on, maybe you can also share a little bit on what is happening in Sridam. Well, there's so really on the spot now. Such great stories and powers going on here that I was just sitting here and listening in awe and sucking in everything and thinking, oh, I should do this. Oh, I should do this. Um, well, I'm working on the reappraisal. I think we call it of a, a cultural historical collection of a city called Schiedam. And we're trying to do that with all uh, inhabitants of the city. Uh, and at, the, at first we're focusing on, on the uh, part of the collection that we call uh, migration histories. And so we are looking for different people from the city with different cultural backgrounds, with migration backgrounds that can be sixth generation that came from Germany in 18th century because they were poor and they needed money and worked in Schiedam, or that can be the people who just moved here a year ago for different reasons. And it is interesting, I'm just not gonna speak up loud, think out loud. It is interesting to hear you both talk about communities. Well, in the Netherlands, the word communities can be perceived difficult because we prefer talking about networks and not you're not from the Chinese community, you're somebody with a Chinese background, which doesn't mean that you're a representative to of the, of the Chinese communities. And for me at the moment, that's where my headspace most of the time is how can we make sure that if we're gonna do such a pro program with or about migration history of which we have nothing in the collection and with, we, wanna, we wanna make a team with different people from the city that we can talk about what we should have in the collection how can we make sure that we don't have our blind spots in who are we missing out? Or should we just acknowledge that we are missing out? And how can we motivate and empower people to feel safe at our place to say, hey, I'm here as well. I have my own story and I wanna share the story with you guys and maybe it could be interesting. But that's a bit that's going on <laughs> in my head. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, and I guess I also, <laughs> you know, this uh, the work with community, right? It, it's really interesting because I keep moving around different like parts of the world, different continents, and whatever you are, like that word is received in a different way. And uh, you know, when I was in Sweden, every every time I remember just you know going back <laughs> um, and starting to try to speak about community every single time I said the word, I will be challenged immediately, right? Like, you know, it's like, why are you using that word? We don't, like, I mean, in Sweden, they would say like, we don't even have a translation for that word in our language. So, you know, it's like, and and I think in Europe, it's, it's a completely different context. It's a completely different understanding of the word. Um, I use it in the sense, I guess, as a North American or, and even in North America from South America also changes the connotation. But um, when I use community, I guess I'm thinking of groups of people that have common interests. And I think one of the reactions that I had in Sweden is that people immediately thought I was talking about ethnicity and I wasn't. And, you know, like, and so like sometimes it's larger, right? Like, it, it, you know, but like I said, it's more like groups of people, like, you know, LGBT community. And I mean, in Spain, they call it collective. They don't call it community. So it changes. So I think it is, it's, it's. It's it, what I have learned, I think, from all of this is that, yeah, you need to listen to how people refer to these groups of people. Uh, what I learned, for example, in Sweden is that they were referred to as movements, right? Like, I mean, even that was the name of the project, like the Museum of Movements, because it was seen as, you know, like the women's movement or the LGBTQ movement. And it's just, I guess, sort of learning, like, 
what terminology people use. Um, and yeah, I mean, with, you know, migrants as well, like migrants, I mean, they can be a community, they can be a movement, they can be different movements. And then also to think about communities of something that is not monolithic, right? Like it's not just one thing, like there are divisions inside of these groups. And when you're engaging with um, different groups of people that belong to different collectives or groups or, you know, whatever you call them, also to understand that, that they're not representing the whole group or the whole community because you're only dealing with one part of, you know, this larger group and everyone has a piece of their truth or the larger story and all of them are valid, right? And I think it's, it's really important for us as museum professionals to understand that and to acknowledge that as well in the work that we do, because uh, I remember something here, for example, at the Human Rights Museum in Canada, um, something that at the beginning, you know, we had trouble or that people will react and be like, but, but you know, you have one person or you have one oral history, two or three oral history speaking, and that doesn't represent that community. We're like, yeah, no, we're completely aware of that. But what we realized is that we needed to make that clear and visible to people to understand that when we were engaging as well with some people, it was we were engaging with them because there was a previous relationship because uh, we had built, you know, uh, this relationship of trust with them, but it wasn't uh, for us to say that we could represent the story of a whole collective or a group of people. And I think that's also important, and especially when it comes to migrants, right? Because they're so, we are so diverse when it comes to uh, migrant groups. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. I'm, um, um, I'm really, really curious also about uh, uh, structural questions here yeah, because in the um, Armando, the uh, definition of, um, of diversity which you gave at the beginning and, and also your understanding of diversity as, uh, as a working tool, as a methodology, as an analytic uh, category. Um, I think this is really something which uh, just opened my eyes because I was asking through all my work um I'm, or we often get so emotional about our work on diversity and human rights and and also anti-racist work in museums and we need something we need something in our heads something like a tool in order to uh, to work with this like really to work and and not um, not always to be uh stuck in our emotions so for me this uh, which you which you give is very important and uh, i'm um I'm wondering, I also would love to talk a little bit about uh, things which are uh, going not very good. So not only best practices, but also failure, uh, failures maybe. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, uh, in Germany, we have something, uh, a program which is called uh, diversity agents. So these are people which go to museum and just one person which has this huge Ask to diversify the museum and uh, and also the collections and uh, uh, so and people are uh, very often they don't come very far and it, it is especially collections and curators where they are confronted with a uh, yeah with a, with a high uh, border um, so and and people start building working groups and and trying to make networks within the museum. So maybe both of you and Julie, because what what you saw, what what you were told about your museum is really exciting. Your work is uh, work you are doing. How how can you give people the uh, opportunity to do this? Or do you have also people in your museums who say no, we don't want to work like this? And how can we involve everyone in this diversity approach? Um, it's, I think it's very important to ask the question of failures because um, I actually recently uh, discovered that my museum has a huge bias when it comes to age because we, um, we, we have really, you know, um, been, you know, gathering different communities around the museum and, and uh, we've made exhibitions. Um, together with uh, with our audiences but suddenly uh, I had um, I was on a tour with with one of the you know core um, visitors of the museum who has been a member since you know the late 80s or something 
And we walked around uh, this exhibition and she just looked at me, Julie, they are young. All the stories are stories from young people. And yeah, they are women and men and uh, transgender and all sorts of stories, but there are no women over 50. And I was just like, no, <laughs> because I realized that, that that is actually one of the most invisible groups in society. And also it's our core audience. It's women over 50. And I was so ashamed. So that made me realize that I have to, you know, test everything. And I mean, you're not necessarily supposed to include everyone in each exhibition, but you definitely have to be aware of such a huge bias as this one. So it's just to say, hmm, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not perfect. <laughs> so the, the, just a failure story from here. Um, yeah, <laughs> lots of failures, lots of, you know, things. And also like, I mean, especially when working with diverse communities and, and all of this, I mean, it is not easy, right? Because first of all, like I said, if there's no structural change, if there is no willingness to support this work, um, it, it can't go that far, right? And so I think the main thing is, like I said, if we're only looking at diversity as that difference that doesn't make a difference, it is difficult. I mean, that Museum of Movements in Sweden is, I think, one of the best examples, you know, of, of that. Like, it was so successful with all these different groups and communities that, you know, came, like, you know, that space that, you know, I talked about, it was fully booked, you know, completely, like, fully booked, like, everything people were, like, you know, like, all of these activists, of all these people, groups, collectives, you know, movements <laughs> coming, really owning that space. And, um, I mean, I left in March, right, to to go to Medellin, but just in September, the government announced that they would not renew uh, funding for the project. Uh, and that's again, right? Like it is this idea that you want something that is diverse, but when it requires commitment, when it requires, you know, like the structural change and whatever, then you're not willing to do that. And I think that is one of the biggest failures because you're not failing yourself, but you're failing all of those communities who trusted, you know, that project, who trust, like, who were engaged, who are coming, who are like already appropriated that space, who have all of their activities happening there. And now you just say, well, it's not going to happen. Um, so yeah, that's one of the big failures. Also other failures, which is not in a completely different direction. To me, it's when we don't have people who reflect these groups and these communities or just diverse communities uh, in the people who are making the decisions inside of our institutions. I think that's one of the biggest failures that we have. Um, for example, I can talk about uh, one of the cases from um, the Human Rights Museum. There are many to talk about in there, but um, with um, an exhibition, the last exhibition I worked with, uh, which was with the Rohingya community, which, you know, right now they're experiencing a genocide in Burma and they're a migrant community coming to, you know, they've been in Canada, they've been here from, since the 1990s. And trying to work on that exhibition was very challenging. It was very difficult because everyone who was working in this exhibition in the museum except for me did not have an experience of migration like i came to canada as an asylum seeker right and i'm also a racialized person as you know the rohingya community is and they just could not understand that it was not okay to present the story of the community without consulting with them, that it was not okay for them to choose a photographer who had never worked with the community, a photographer who was also not racialized, who had not experienced, um, you know, of migration. And of course it can, it can be done, it can happen if you have built a relationship, but this photographer in particular did not have any working relationship with that community. It, they did not understand that you were doing a triple white gaze on this exhibition, which was first you present in the story of this community. It's like if you're doing the story of women through a male photographer, right? Like, and so you're presenting first from that photographer, you know, and who's white, who's not racialized and all of that. Then all the team inside of the museum is also white without experiences of migration. And then the audience that you're presenting this story to. So why are you doing this work? Why are you taking that story from this community and presenting it as entertainment for, you know, these audiences? So like all of these are failures or that like you see, like I can see it because I don't want my story as a migrant to be treated that way. And I can say that because I have that lived experience. 
but not having people with lived experience inside of the institutions where those decisions are taking place is I think one of the biggest failures. And that I think when we stay with only diversity put on the walls, but not you know, that really meaningful participation and inclusion inside of institutions. Yes, thank you. Thank you for this. Um, yeah, very, very strong, very powerful experiences with you. Uh, we take with us. Uh, well, um, if there are more questions, please go and ask. Otherwise, I will I will propose that maybe slowly we can we can finish the conversation and give some of us to start their days and some of us to, to end their days. And um, yeah, there is there is, there is a lot of information in chat. So if you did not look at this, look there, and we will put the meeting online. Uh, I was very um, yeah, empowered by these talks. Yes, Danielle? Before you wrap up, because Selma wants to ask a question before you. Oh, sorry, Selma. Yes. Go Thank on. you so much for, for the space and the microphone. I wanted to follow up on something that you said, Armando. Um, I was hearing your thoughts about kind of inclusive participation and kind of the, the role of the gays or the white gays um, in this sense in kind of creating the narrative and how the history is presented. So I'm not sure if you mentioned this earlier, but in your experience, do you think that it is a good practice to pay specific attention to kind of the curatorial process or the process of shaping the narrative? So to give an example, if, if we are working with a community that is racialized, do you think it is important to make sure that the people involved in that project are all people with similar experiences from the curator, the photographer, the point of contact, or do you think that that's not a necessity? Thank you, uh, Selma, for that um, question. Yeah, I think we need to have, if we're going to tell the story of our group, that we don't have lived experience about, I think we need to have people definitely in the team. People need to be present um, in the curatorial process. I mean, I was a curator, right? But I also did not like calling myself a curator. I always tried to work in sort of a co-curation sort of model. So what I did is that I um, usually created uh, curatorial committees that were coming from those uh, different groups of communities that you know we're working with. And also um, here is that, it's important that we don't just go and take people's knowledge and expertise, the expertise on their own stories, right? Um, but we also uh, pay them because we all get paid for the work that we do. We, as museum workers, we have salaries at museums, you know, a lot of them charge entries, they get, you know, visitors, they get all of that. Everyone gets paid, everyone benefits from these stories that we're telling, but we're not paying the people who are bringing their expertise about the story. So I think that's, you know, one step, but yes. Um, so I always work with these um, curatorial committees that ensure that um, there was always people who had the lived experience that were part of the curatorial process. I think it, there is no other way to be able to, uh, to do justice to these stories and to present them because people are the own experts of their own stories. And like, you know, like I said before, I, cannot present, I mean, I worked with a story, like in the Rohingya you know, exhibition, for example, yes, I, I did have some understanding because I was an asylum seeker and all of that, but I also worked in exhibitions with, you know, indigenous women from Guatemala, which I don't have any, lived. I'm not a woman, like I cannot understand, you know, those uh, lived experiences. So I need to bring the people who do to be able to influence and to shape that curatorial process. So for me, it was always about working together uh, in, in, in the exhibitions. That's why I always said it was co-curation because I do not believe in um, the role of, uh, you know, like the star curator uh, that decides on everything that's gonna go on the walls because I just don't think that, that, that we should be working that way anymore. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, we work with the term co-creation as well. Uh, or co-curation, uh, and uh, we all also have these uh, advisory boards uh, for each exhibition. 
Um, and, and it's very important uh, for us that we, you know, each text uh, in the exhibition that, that it, it's tested uh, by, by several um, kinds of people. So yeah, co-curation is the good word here. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. There is a comment in the chat by Diana that uh, it should be a rule for more co-creation generally. And um, so um, I think this is a, this is a maybe a good question to, uh, uh, to close the discussion. We could talk ages and each of us has huge experiences of uh, what to say. And I really have to try to slow down and not talk about more experiences. And that's why I <laughs> I thank you so much, everyone who took time at this hour and and, and shared in this safe space um, your experiences today. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the next session, uh, which we will have in uh, January in this series. And the session will be on, Rihanna, could you jump in and help me with the date and with the topic, please? I don't think we have a date actually, um, but it will be about digital uh, digital collections. <laughs> digital collections. Okay. Well, stay safe and thank you so much. <laughs>